again for coming. I'm going to introduce uh, Jibwe Elder Billy Blackwell, and he is the mastermind behind this all. And thanks very much, Billy, for doing this. The idea that we're doing here is trying to show you that Cook County has a history that's uh, unbelievable in a fantastic history. And we have uh, seven speakers tonight that are going to uh, tell you a lot of things. You might know a little bit of it. We're going back in history, so take your mind now and go all the way back, 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 and we're even going to go further. <laughs> and we're going to bring it to the present day. This is from Rick and Lou Anderson's collection. And this point, um, if you to believe the archaeologists, is somewhere between 10,500 to 11,000 years old. Now this is, so whoever made this, whoever flaked this out, this is right after the glaciers and Lake Agassi, uh, Agassi um, all the waters poured out, and this is, was a pretty tough environment that, you're, that people were coming into. Um, and somewhere around 6,000 years ago, some of the first metalworking in North America happened right here, and this is a result of that. So all right, let's go back in time. The 1700s, what's the biggest city or town in the Midwest? Grand Portage. Grand Portage, 1,200 to 2,000. Chicago isn't even a place yet. Well, as you could see from the different spear points and stuff that were shown, that people who were here changed a lot. So what I'm going to tell is how the Ojibwe got to be here, because that's who, when the Europeans got here, who they contacted. So the people that went north were uh, the two clans, were the, the Crane and the Fish. When they got to this area, they ended up encountering, the people they encountered in this area in particular were the Sioux. And Billy's going to get into some of the battles that we had in Cook County with them, which is what I'm excited about. <laughs> and so we're lucky to have with us today Sue Kerfoot, who uh, has a wonderful history that she's going to tell you about. Of, uh, uh, and her mother-in-law, Justine Kerfoot, wrote a wonderful, wonderful book. So you're going to hear some history now of Gunflint Lake. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, I have to tell you that I'm, Tim and I are the only two people who were not born in this county. And I'm an immigrant, but I know a few stories. And many of them I did get from my mother-in-law. The construction of the Gunflint Trail took place over a number of years. Some of it, they must have snuck in before the Treaty of 1854 because in 1830, there was a tote road, supposedly fit for ox oxen, that goes past the East Bearskin Junction into Rove Lake. And it quickly fell into disuse. I'm not really sure what trading po this trading post, who they were supposed to trade with then. And part of the railroad that was co coming in from Thunder Bay actually took stuff out in the terms of logs up to Thunder Bay. And there was also a railroad that came in from Cascade that they took and logged up near Rose Lake. By 1917, it was time to seriously start to improve. And so the road up to the Pines was improved. And then they did a little more in 1918. But in 1919, a new engineer named Jim Smith took and started the road up and his crew could build one mile of road a week. And the road by 1920 had gone up to Swamper Lake. <laughs> no questions. This is a tremendous, tremendous history, and we're just getting little parts as we go along. And all of a sudden, human beings are finding out and talking to the Indians that there is a, something that the Great Spirit reached down from the sky and gave us. That was that flint. And that flint was so powerful, it lighted their fires. They made cutlery from it. 
In the BWCA was found 10,000 years old hatchets from the flint at Gunflint, spearheads. And we're going to hear from one of our elders, Mill Paul, today on stories and a picture of, of a wonderful, wonderful uh, bit of history of Saginaga. We're going to hear about his great aunt, and we're going to hear about the Blackstones, a great part of this history that's in this county. And this photo here is my mother, my father, and me with the little uh, rabbit skin coat, and my sister Vera. And that's our main transportation was right there, the dogs. Milt also tells, and we'll go into a little bit about uh, Shabagizigok in a little while here, but and we'll get into the <coughs> Blackstones in a little while, which is a great great part of the history. Blackstone one had a, had a daughter. And do we have a picture of her now? And where do you see this picture? Wait a minute. Shabagizhigok. means piercing thunder through the sky lady is her name. And Milt's dad's name was? Nigan Wodum. Nigan Wodum, leading thunder. Debasinukwe. That's my mother. Low Thunder. They're all from these clans and from these people. She was 114 years old when she died. As a kid, Milt used to listen to her talk and talk. Yeah, she used to tell stories. <clears throat> In uh, Ojibwe, they call it Odsoke. And she would tell us children that she was uh, the first one that falls asleep dies. So she kept the captive audience. <laughs> Until she got done and said, okay, you can go to bed now. <laughs> she, uh, she would, ah, this okay, means tell legends or tell yeah. stories. And, and uh, there are very few left that do that. But this was the old days, and she told Milt a lot of stuff, and she, told, she tells the people, years from now, you'll still hear me, you'll remember this. Yeah. She said it was so hard to live here, and way back in time, we fought the Sioux, the Buanuk. But we were able to drive them out of here. Can you tell them, Milt, what they used, what they threw inside their uh, mounds? They would uh, use uh, hot flint, and they'd throw it down through the, the pipe in the tent, and it would hit the hot coals, and it would set off a smoke, and uh, it'd drive the Sioux right out. And then they clubbed them when they came out. And you know, this is- But they won. They won. <laughs> And it's, it's awful stuff to hear, but it's history. That's Walter and Alma Caribou. She is a direct relation from the Blackstones. Milt's great aunt was, a, was a, a daughter of Chief Blackstone. We have another one here from Chief Blackstone, many in Cook County. And they, if we had more time, we could do this for more hours, but we don't today. But all of these people come from Saganaga, Grand Portage, Chibito Bigum, the Grand Twin Bays, that's Grand Marais. They, these are old families from all of that. So he comes directly from Chief Caribou of the Grand Portage Treaty. His mother lived at Saganaga, Kakage. And she's directly from the Lac Lacroix people, from the Gizik people, the Sky people, directly from Blackstone. So this is our history that was walking in Cook County. And we're going to see these are by our artists, these fantastic paintings that they're doing as we go through. Milt's wife, Alice. This is the artwork they've done to show in 1820s. In the maps that you saw Tim Cochran was showing you, from the Indians, they learned different names of places. At the Devil's Track River, it was called Manitou, which means spirit walking on the ice. There must have been, the Indians had seen in the winter time, either the tracks of or a money to or a spirit walking on that ice. Years later, Mr. Sam Zimmerman Sr., my great-grandfather, moves to Beaver Bay. It's too tough to make it through the winter. He moves back to New Ulm. When the Sioux uprising starts, 
The Sioux are given no money for their lands, no food. The Civil War starts, they're starving. 2,000 are outside for weeks. No food, nothing. They're starved to death. They start a big war. It was awful what happened to them. The war they were in was awful. War is no good. Many, many people died. Terrible, terrible deaths. And what happened to them after was also terrible. He then, through all of that, his father is killed and two of his brothers. He hides out in a haystack. And he, uh, just as he's taken out to be killed, the soldiers come. He lives through it somehow. He then moves up years later, a few years later, to Beaver Bay, Gagishkenskog the place or the, the river of the little cedar. And he falls in love with and marries Jane Elliot Maymashquash. And that is how a great deal of Cook County and Graham Ray, Graham Portage comes from. And he then later, he loses a leg. He has a peg leg. So he has a peg leg. He has a regular snowshoe and he has a snowshoe for his crutch. And now you're seeing some of the artwork done here. And later on when people are talking about Devil's Track Lake and Devil's Track River, well, those Indians must have been right. There's something been walking on here. Maybe it was the devil, the Devil's Track. And that's how it got its name. That they wanted to change the name of White Sky <coughs> Rock to Inspiration Hill the people thought that white sky, blue sky, red sky, coal star were just descriptions when you look up into the sky, not realizing that they were actual people. The first one is white sky's dad and white sky and probably coal star. This was just given to me. This is white sky standing in the center holding a, a tourist baby. They wanted a picture of their child being held by Native Americans. He was 16 at the time. The next picture is when he was about 20, he became a conservation officer in the area. You see the badge and the gun on his hip. The next picture is in 1912, shortly before he died of TB. And you can see all the log or the stumps from the loggers when they cut the trees and left them that high. Pretty hard to homestead around that. The Chippewa City started roughly 1884 and it lasted until 1907 when a forest fire came along and destroyed all the houses. The church was saved by a bucket brigade. I want to first of all thank the artists and acknowledge them. Jan Attrick, Al Alice Powell, Heidi Sabania did this wonderful painting, and David Hahn. We asked them to try to imagine uh, a time before we have photographs of. We offered them maps and some oral histories, and they created beautiful images for us. So thank you. Maybe we should give them a round of applause. <laughs> David Hahn. Uh, took the other angle from up the hill and uh, made the pond that we all know was in Grand Marais um, and is sometimes still, um, made that a little bit more prominent and uh, painted another beautiful image. So just really nice to have those. Um, what you might not know is that before uh, Grand Marais was officially um, called Grand Marais, there was once a post office called Hiawatha in the 1850s there. Uh, again, didn't last very long necessarily. People like the Hohenstein and Mayhew, you see their names there at the bottom. They've purchased this property now and now the points are named after them. Um, so between 1880 and 1885, the population of Cook County grew substantially because uh, development of the harbor was starting to take place. Um, it's a nice protected area, but they also wanted to now bring big ships in, so dredging uh, began, and that's what you see in this uh, early 1880s map. Um, a little bit later in 1885, uh, a break wall and a lighthouse was put in, and there's just an image inset there 
that shows uh, kind of what the uh, east side of the harbor looked like at that time. And it was essential because, as probably most of you know, there was no uh, road to get here, so the only way to come was by boat. And so it wasn't until a little bit later that road building began, and it wasn't until the late 1920s that uh, you could actually drive up to Grand Marais rather than having to take the America or another steamship in the summer anyway, and, and dog sleds, of course, in the winter. A little bit about that sign there. Um, Rudy Bosch was, was running for senator, and he had a great plan for this area on the Boundary Waters and was taking more land than what we thought that was necessary, and I got so mad I decided to run against him. So in my three-day campaign, I pulled more votes than Governor Harold Stass, and I came in second, and Rudy pulled his uh, uh, plan off the map. The name for the new county was asked to be Verendry, an early French explorer and fur trader. The legislature said it would be too hard of a name to spell or say. I just had trouble with it. <laughs> so they came up with Cook for a Civil War major, Michael Cook from Faribault. He never stepped foot in Cook County <laughs> because he was a hero. This was back in 1874. Logging played an important part here. There were big pine trees. The lumber companies, sawmills, employed a lot of, the, of these pioneers. They flowed their logs down rivers, used horses to haul. When the bobtail trucks came into service, the loggings were hauled downtown and piled at the Coast Guard station, which is now the parking lot. From 92 to 94 percent of Cook County is owned by the government. I went to Washington and testified in Congress on behalf of the county board. Our concern was motor use size on the big lakes, keeping the resource open and homes in private ownership. With a population around 5,000 and the increase to 80 to 90,000 in the summer, we needed revenue. The tax burden was already tight. We didn't have to have more government taking land off of tax rules. 1876 approximately, uh, the businesses in Cook County, along with the city of Grand Ray and the Cook County commissioners, we formed the Boundary Waters Alliance. And county commissioners, city council people, business people, we all spent time in Washington and lobbying. And we've always said, and we still say that, it isn't what we want out there, but if we hadn't been there, we'd probably lost a lot more. And the ex-mayor passed away, Richard Humphrey, myself, we were sitting in, Vinto, Bruce Vinto was one of the sponsors of that Boundary Water Bill that Chet talked about in 78. And we were sitting in his office, and uh, they were including North and South Fowl Lake at that time. And but anyway, we're sitting there, and I says to uh, Bruce Vento, was actually there himself with, with a couple of aides, and I said, do you realize that North and South Fall Lake are man-made lake, and you want that <laughs> for history? And uh, there's a dam up there that was put in in logging days, and it's still there. Many of you people have sure been up there. And Taconite Harbor was started in 1950-51, and we were shipping Taconite out of Taconite Harbor in the late fall of 57. In fact, I was an employee down there and helped load one of the first Taconite boats that left Taconite Harbor. One is Benny Ambrose of the Gunflint Trail. And the reason he's such a character is the government couldn't stop him. When they did the BWCA, they, they passed this law that, that, that no one could live in there, no one could have a cabin in there, nothing modern in there. And the county, which is now trying to get Bali's blacksmith shop, Al Bali, who had a cabin on an island, they said, we're going to take it out. He tied himself to it, his son with a gun, and he said, come get me. They come and got him, burnt his house down with government laws, what they did up there. But when they went for Benny Ambrose, he wouldn't leave. They went into uh, Otter Track Lake. He refused to go. I don't know how he did it. But there was two in all the BWCA, one near Ely, and Benny Ambrose, and they let him stay there. 
He was such a trapper, an old timer. He could walk for mile after mile. When he was trapping beaver, he'd take his shirt off, put his head under the water to look at the trap. He was just like an animal. They did everything, but people stood up for him so much, they finally, they call him a BWCA warden, and they let him stay in there. Benny Ambrose. One day at their office in Duluth, all of a sudden the door opened and he walked in. He said, what is that you people do, just sit here all day and do nothing? <laughs> they said, Benny Ambrose must be here. So he's a legend. And another one of the commercial fishing days, I'll give you this one real quick, but is Helmer Okvik. And boy, that's a name you'll never forget. In Reader's Digest, 1950, 58. He made Reader's Digest. You saw all of these hundreds from Duluth all the way to Pigeon, uh, Pigeon Point, Pigeon River. Commercial fishermen in the fall fishing herring, the big Northwesters. Carl Hammer died, drowned in those days. Helmer Offick went out, almost dying, going up and down, searching and searching to see if he could pull him from the water. He wasn't able to. He went to Duluth for two days in the hospital. They later gave him the, the Carnegie Medal, it's called, and uh, he was given that medal for what he'd done. And before he died, everybody knew about this through the Reader's Digest, but he was always kind of bashful, stay by himself at his old fishing, uh, fishing shack he'd stay in most of the time. And anyway, Ralph and Jean Hagen, his, uh, his grandchildren, before he died, he came and talked to them and said, I want you to talk to Mark Hansen. Have Mark come out and see me. Mark was a great carpenter, could make anything to this day in Cook County. And he said, hey, Mark, he says, you know what I want you to do? He says, I'm a real Viking. Can you make this? And he showed him a picture of a, of a ship. He said, that's a coffin. He says, I know. That's what I want you to make. He says, see this suit? I bought this in Port Arthur in 1939. When I die... He says, you guys come, put me in there in that coffin, light up all that cedar, put me on my skiff, and send me to Valhalla. Ha, 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 he said. Well, it happened, almost. He died. They went and got the body. They put him into his suit. Mark Hansen made it, everything. They had it all set to go. But Helmer's wife didn't know about it yet. All of a sudden... Law enforcement came in, the state attorney general, the local funeral home called him because, of course, they don't want to miss the money. They call the attorney general. They send up people and come talk to Mark Hansen and says, you're going to be in jail. That's illegally. So they went and talked to Helmer's uh, wife, and she brought the grandkids over, and she said, he might think he's going to Valhalla, but you guys are going to jail, and he's going to be buried in Hovland Cemetery. And he was. And like Cook County, it went out in a great history. So I'm going to ask all of our speakers to stand up. Everybody in the audience. I'd like everybody to stand up, too. It took us two and a half hours, but you have a tremendous history of Cook County. And I'm going to turn it over to Carrie, and we want to thank everybody for coming here. She's got a few words to say, and miigwech. I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody for speaking and everybody for coming. Um, there will be some treats out in the lobby. Uh, we also have a basket out. If you'd like to make a donation, I would suggest doing that, and we're going to offer that to Billy Blackwell because he spent hundreds of hours in the last few months working on this. So thank you, Billy. We had a meeting in, in, in Carleton County, and uh, Governor Purpage was there with the seven counties, and, and Governor Purpage was praising Cook County for all the things that we have done. We did a recycling center, we did a community center, we had done a, 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 the state park, we got that there, and a few other things, and he, and he said to everybody, he said, I wish you could be as aggressive as Cook County. And he said, Chet, I want to thank you, and, and uh, uh, for your leadership, and I wish other counties could have that kind of leadership. And I said, well, Governor, you know, if it wasn't for Cook County, there'd be no point to Minnesota. Be great. Me no one got men. 
What he's saying is that thank you and I'll see you again because we in Anishinaabe never say goodbye. I'll nope. see you again. Miigwech. 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 Thank you, he says. <laughs>